Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Haley Robinson Dake and Grady Powell. Haley Robinson Dake advises early stage companies and teaches at the University of Texas, Austin. She was previously the CEO at Kamek, an outdoor based brand in Austin, Texas, that designs performance gear to elevate time outside. Having worked at IDEO, Bain and Company, and Stanford University, Haley's most inspired at the intersection of design, business, and education. Haley holds a BA in business and finance from UT Austin and a joint MBA and MED from Stanford University. She is a National Outdoor Leadership School graduate and worked as a field instructor in Wyoming, leading outdoor expeditions focused on personal leadership. She lives in Austin, Texas with her husband, Christian, son, James, and dog, Callie. Grady Powell is a futures-oriented strategist, executive, and entrepreneur. He is the founder and CEO of Open Fields, a research strategy and design firm committed to helping leaders imagine and implement a more creative and just future. He is also co-founder and trustee of Capita, a creative think tank for harnessing the power of big ideas to ensure a future in which all young children and their families flourish. Previously, Grady led a leadership development nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., and worked as an agency guy at EP and Company Advertising. He attended Furman University, where he studies economics and ran cross-country and track and field. He lives in Greenville, South Carolina, with his wife, Sarah, and their four children. Haley Grady, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just excited about this conversation and looking forward to your thoughts and insights on, on innovation. I'd like to get started with a simple question. What is, in your mind, uh, innovation? I think simply Grady and I are actually discussing this before we jumped on the call. Grady has a very succinct version of innovation, but just being able to take a new idea and apply it in a new way. So I, I would say that innovation is about knowing when and how to apply a different method that allows different ideas to take root. Mm-hmm. It's starting from a place of creativity and inspiration to expand thinking and then take that thinking and idea to a new application. Mm, mm-hmm, right. Grady, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think innovative people are always looking around them and finding creative thoughts or insights or new tools and, and finding new ways to use them mm. and use them in different contexts and use them to be more effective, more creative, and more productive. Mm-hmm. I think it's something, a skill you can actually learn. Right. Tell me more about innovation as a skill. What does that look like? This is something we've actually been working on together. Haley and I have been with a colleague, Jim Gilmore, the author of The Experience Economy, where we talk a lot about the beginning of that process is often observation. Mm -hmm. That We think innovation is actually about design or development or scale, right? Mm -hmm. But really the act of innovation, we think, begins with seeing a situation or seeing a human behavior or seeing a need Mm -hmm. in a new way that other people may not notice. So if you want to be innovative, go to the place that no one else is doing the work, right? Right. If you're in the middle of a market, it's already there. Mm. You got to go somewhere else. And I think that often begins with seeing opportunities in new places. And when you ask the question, how is that a skill? We actually believe you can cultivate skills of observation. Mm -hmm. There are tools, methods that you can use to see insights, ideas in new ways. I see. I see. And is this something that if I wanted to learn to be more innovative, so you think there's kind of two schools of thought. Some people think there are these sort of genius innovators, the Tesla, Einstein, Henry Ford, you know, solo individual genius innovators. But more and more, I think as we learn more about how innovation works and how inspiration works, it seems that there's more conversation around the ecosystem and the environment to support innovation as you talk about it as a skill and, you know, powers of observation, it sounds like you might have um, more of a view in the latter sort of camp. In your work, have you, have you come across a lot of attributes around, you know, what it takes to be an innovative person, or is it really more of a, a learnable skill set? Haley, what do you think about that? I think it's 
absolutely a learnable skill set. One of one of the things that we've been exploring in our class is how you engage in the creative process. And Grady mentioned observation is a really great starting place. By association. Yes, by association. So one of the ideas that Jim Gilmore has been working with us to develop and equip our students with is lateral thinking, creative thinking methods, and one of them is by association. So taking two things that typically don't exist together in the realm of thought Mm -hmm. and looking at what patterns or connections they have and then how that might apply to new ideas. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of tools and practices. I also think we, we talk about learning something and it's a skill that can be practiced and it starts with trying out small things in your thought pattern or in your daily life and Mm -hmm. and creating a feedback loop to learn from those so that you can grow in innovation. And when we talk about, you mentioned the two types of innovators, Tim Brown, who was one of the leads at IDEO, he breaks down innovation into several different categories. And most of the innovation that we see, which I think is accessible to most people is incremental innovation. It's the innovations that are taking existing ideas and applying them to existing audiences, Mm -hmm. but it's new in the nature that it hasn't been done before. And the ones that you mentioned, like Henry Ford, that often has an equality of invention. And I would say, Tim Brown would say that's like revolutionary innovation. That's something that's a total category changer. Mm -hmm. And so how can we start to push out as most of us, I think are more inclined to incremental innovation and gain the skills to be revolutionary innovators. And I think it takes a lot of work and practice and discipline sure. around sure. building those creative capacities. Mm-hmm. What do you see as the relative value? I mean, I know there's a star quality to the revolutionary aspect of innovation, but can incremental innovation be as valuable as these revolutionary innovations? Define, <laughs> define valuable. I, right, right. My instinct would be to say, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Are we thinking of value in terms of scale or the kind of delta of impact? But I, I think when there is a lot of value that can be generated from small innovations in the well-being of families, communities, how you operate your household. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's so much value that can be generated from things that may not be considered revolutionary. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Grady, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, real quick to go back to your previous question. As Haley was saying, there are obviously sort of innovators that break the mold and that are going to operate at a level that most of us aren't going to operate. Mm -hmm. But even those folks are never alone, right? And I think it's, I think we definitely are of the mindset that doing something new, breaking into a new space, sharing a new idea is always an act of vulnerability in a way. It's an act that takes a lot of uh, courage and stamina. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're surrounded by a community that's going to encourage that, and celebrate the small wins you make along the way and keep asking you questions and keep reminding yourself of who you are and what your purpose is. That's always going to, I think, be critical to sustaining that kind of creative thought. Mm -hmm. We were talking about incremental versus revolutionary innovations and what relative value of the two types. Yeah, that's a good question. Is the is the invention of the vaccine more revolutionary, more impactful than the invention of the COVID vaccine? Right. No, that's that's an interesting question. Mm. Another thing that's really interesting, this is Kevin Kelly in his book, What Technology Wants, talks about sort of the evolution of technology and a lot of innovations sort of inevitable in a way, right? Uh-huh. There are existing technologies and experiences and the whole thing's an ecosystem in a way, right? right? All these technologies and advancements are evolving and we all play smaller roles than we like to imagine. Right. If Louis Pasteur had invented pasteurization, you know, which expands life expectancy in the U.S. exponentially, right? Somebody would have done it. Right. Not because Louis Pasteur was a, the only genius who could have ever figure that out, but because we're all in an ecosystem where ideas are advancing, technology is advancing, and we get to participate in that, right? Mm, right. And obviously certain people have access to those communities and that type of education and the kind of tools and resources that it takes. But in some ways it's freeing to imagine that our job is sort of show up, show up as ourselves and show up with the voice that we've been given. And I don't know that we always have to worry about or can't even control the type of impact we're going to have in that context. Mm, interesting. Yeah. It free, sort of freeing yourself from the burden of expectations around outcomes and impact. I also like the sort of point you're making there about evolutionary uh, or incremental innovations are often built on the back of a revolutionary innovation at some point. You know, you talk about COVID being a vaccine, but the whole protocol and concept around vaccines and the invention of the first one 
was a revolutionary thing. I hadn't really thought about that sort of ordering of those types of things before. That's a great point. Thinking about the ecosystem for innovation that you, you referenced, tell me about how you intend to show up and play a part in that ecosystem. What role do you see yourselves playing? One role, particularly speaking, I mean, Grady and I work in, in several different spheres, but in our work collaboration around MetaTrack, sure. Grady just mentioned the importance of having communities of being surrounded by people who are asking questions, who are supporting you, who are allowing you to risk and be vulnerable. One of the roles that we see is creating the container and the space for that dialogue to happen. Mm -hmm. And especially in contrast to this cultural moment, which is very driven and dictated by technology, particularly coming now, hopefully out of the pandemic as we sure resume roles that are more embodied in physical shared physical space where historically that's where a lot of those new ideas were sparked because conversation was aimless and we were navigating the world with a more observational view than being screen bound. Mm -hmm. One of the things Jim Gilmore says is everything you see on a screen is derivative, meaning that someone else saw it first. And it's important as innovators that we are able to see and adopt new site for what's out our windows and to mm. be grounded in a reality. And so how do we encourage people to go from where they're at in front of their screens and have new site for the world and also create space and place for people to, to have those conversations and to be able to encourage each other towards those insights because learning happens with other people and from other people. And so our, one of our roles as educators in that sense is creating that environment. That makes sense. Well said. Do you want to give people one or two sentences about MetaTrack to put that in a bit of context? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. We started MetaTrack because I think Haley and I have both had experiences where we've been in communities with people who love to learn, who were willing to ask big questions about their lives and their purpose and their impact. And who loved to learn for the sake of learning. This wasn't in order to scale a company or sell a business or to get a degree, or it was actually sort of approaching life with a very entrepreneurial attitude, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we were encouraged and taught, like once you see your whole life in that way, the amount of energy and creativity and freedom and motivation that comes from understanding, you can, you can do things in new ways. You don't have to follow what's always been done. Right. You can find a lot of meaning and purpose wherever you are, you're not really stuck. There are ways to build and to create and to generate communities and meaningful experiences wherever you are. Once you begin to sense that and taste it, it's just something that's infectious, something you want to share, something you want other people to understand and see. And when they do, man, it's so motivating. Uh, it just happens with our students, Haley. It happens with my clients. When they have that aha moment that, wow, I've got permission to be creative here. You know, I thought there was only one way. There's actually lots of ways. Mm -hmm. Those moments where people just feel release and see possibility and all of a sudden are given a little bit of encouragement to pursue it. It's really motivating. And that's really what MetaTrack's been about. It's been creating that kind of environment that Hayden was describing, that kind of community. Especially early on, we've really been focused on young professionals because we feel like so much of the education system right now has narrowed their educational experience. In a lot of my work, a lot of people I work with talk about cradle to career. We're trying to build this whole pipeline that moves kids from early childhood development into pre-K. And so they're kindergarten ready. And so they have third grade reading scores. And so they're hitting their, you know, all the way down the line until they get a great job. Sure. And I think a lot of talented young people get a great job. And then they're like, so what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in some ways, this has been about creating a community around people who have found themselves in that position and reigniting a passion for learning in their lives. Mm. Grady, to, to continue from that, there's the so what, but also the now what. And once you've been part of an education track that, you know, you kind of get spit out the, the culmination of your first job, and then you realize there's an expansive set of choices beyond that, that you'll need to navigate. How do you equip people to take ownership of both their learning and their career journeys from a place of agency, self-understanding, and perspective mm -hmm. that can really influence how they then engage and build as contributors and leaders in their respective spheres, whether that's staying in their job or thinking about what's next. And so MetaTrack is really, how do we equip people to be lifelong learners as a process? Because that process then can have impact 
wherever you want to direct it, whether it's your career or the building and scaling of a company, but getting really curious about the process of being a learner and growing your creative capacities. Because so often we're like focused on the, the outcome, but you don't focus as much on the process and practices that you need to cultivate as a person to drive those outcomes, irrespective of the sphere you're in. Because one of the things we realize is that nowadays work and careers will be more fluid than ever. Right. And people will need to have the skills and the self-awareness to navigate that really thoughtfully and intentionally. Mm. So as we focused on the young professional audience out of the gate, we want to support those individuals to do that, to make decisions mm. creatively, thoughtfully, intentionally, and with meaning and purpose. Mm. Well said. If Metatrack existed when you graduated from high school or college, do you think your path would be different? Here's why I'm asking that question, because the, hearing the two of you talk about it, it sounds like something that could only be born of a, a set of experiences or a set of understanding, a lived experience that underpins what you're doing. So if it existed when you got spit out of the, the career track, do you think you'd have ended up in a different place? I'll give you a quick answer to that, Jared. My experience was that I did have that experience. I mean, that's, that's actually what I'm trying to share. I'm afraid other people don't have it. So mm. I spent four years in college. I didn't think about my career hardly ever. I wasn't at college to get a job. I also am of the la basically the last generation of college students. I didn't have a cell phone in college. I didn't have Facebook in college. I had just gotten my first email address. Right. I did not spend college looking at a phone, worrying about what people thought about me or my posts. Like I spent college taking the bare minimum of my major <laughs> and taking as many electives as I could and all different types of experiences. I had a close group of friends that we did all kinds of independent work at school. We invited speakers to campus. We created conversation groups and book studies. We went on our own trips that we designed. We got research grants to pursue projects we designed together. Mm. And it was all out of a love and passion and curiosity. That, And it was a huge opportunity that we were afforded to do that. Sure, sure. And I, I just see... More and more, people don't understand that experience. Mm -hmm. They feel isolated. They feel pressured. They have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. They feel like their job is to be productive. Right. And those are questions I didn't feel the same pressure around. Part of that's from my upbringing and the way my parents believed in education, what they taught me. Part of that was the experience I had. And part of it is the world that we were in. Sure, sure. There was a little more safe time. It felt a little more safe. It felt a little bit more open. Um, there were still a lot of things that weren't, had not come to the surface that we needed to deal with, but it gave me a grounding now to pursue all kinds of things in my career that I never would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. I have a space to think and act and speak that's outside of this career engine. I, I see. I cultivated a lot of that space prior to my career, and that sustained me and helped me be more creative throughout my career. Mm. That was a beautiful answer, Grady, and made me rethink my initial instinct. It's hard to say, right? Because, you know, the beauty of hindsight and, and imagining a different future, had you known something at a certain point. Sure. I do think that my experience with what Grady just described happened after college, later in my 20s, when I took several risks to do very intensive learning experiences, one in wilderness education, one the leadership and theology fellowship where I first met Grady and then graduate school. I moved eight times in my 20s and had a number of experiences that have informed what we both desire to bring to bear through Metatrack. I do think what would have changed for me had I experienced and been exposed to some of these ideas earlier mm -hmm. is probably my orientation towards work and how I perceived my role in how I was to contribute sure. and pursue career and work. I went to the University of Texas, studied business, had a very almost myopic view of success, <laughs> right. um, pursued strategy consulting and had a wonderful experience, but I lived in fear of my own performance standards and had a lot of limiting beliefs that kept me from really entering more fully into the work and having faith to take risks uh, earlier in my career. Sure. And so I think I, I would have, I hope, <laughs> like sometimes <laughs> there's just maturity and having exposure and experience that changes these things. But of course, I do think being able to have a greater sense of confidence in how I was going to approach work would have been of benefit to me earlier 
we, like you asked the question right out of college and that's mm -hmm. how we would like to serve people who participate in Meditrack is to gain confidence in taking those next steps, even if there's uncertainty in them. Right. Oh, that's also a beautiful answer. Haley, I, I really appreciate the fact that you both sort of had your own Meditrack experiences in, in your career. And, and I can probably think back through my career and identify similar moments. And it feels like what you're doing is bringing a structure and an intentionality to creating those sorts of insights and kind of aha moments uh, for people so that it's less serendipitous and more of a, a, an intentional point in, in, in a person's development. The other element of what jumps out at me is when you sort of unpack this, this concept, um, you know, there's a famous uh, Mark Twain quote that says, I never let my schooling interfere with my education. My mom wasn't very happy when I started my scholarship essay off with that, with that, uh, <laughs> with that quote, <laughs> but it's always been one that I've really mm. sort of been, uh, attracted to because what you, what you both described were sort of, you know, auto, autodidactical sort of, you know, teaching myself, learning on my own, learning, you know, under my own steam, defining my own view of the world. And then schooling takes on a different sort of context. It doesn't, it doesn't become the definition of who you are. It doesn't become the definition of success. It becomes a tool to further your exploration or to deepen your understanding of the world or yourself. And I really, I really think that what you're doing with, with Metatrack is, is going to allow more people to connect with that from a place, you know, I was always a bit of a educational rebel. And so those <laughs> that kind of came to me naturally, but I think there are other people who will get the benefit of, you know, I, I want to connect to something. I want to have some structure, something to kind of hold on to, but I don't want it to define me and I don't want it to be so domain specific that it, it cuts off possibilities. And so that's what I really like about what you've built and what you sort of stand for um, with the work you're doing. And I really appreciate that. Jared, that's one, two quick responses to that. One, I think a lot of people are afraid of domain expertise because it does feel limiting, right? Mm -hmm. That's when you recognize domain expertise as, well, I'm going to sort of put my identity into a domain. Sure. It's very different when I have a, when I have a voice and I have a vision and I have a community that'll support me no matter what, yep. right? Whether I have domain expertise or not, right. then all of a sudden I have a position to stand and say, this domain expertise will help serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. It's something bigger than expertise, right? And I think so often in our lives, we're immersed in cultures or systems that define success for us. We don't have that sort of vantage point to stand that community to stand with that lets us direct it where we want to direct it. Right. So we get swept along. And before you know it, you, you get swept along and you all of a sudden believe all the things that everyone else believes and you feel the same way everyone else feels and you're not sure what you're contributing and you're not sure what your questions are anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. That's normal. And, and we need those moments to step back for silence and reflection and critical thinking to say, where are we going to stand? Sure. Yeah. yeah, no, well said. That's a great way to put that. Just one thought that the uh, ID always says they hire T-shaped people. And that is people who have maybe an expertise or a, a depth of understanding in one specific vertical, but they're able to apply it and imagine its application across a breadth of possibilities. Mm -hmm. That's the top of the T. And I think innovation has a similar T, like you need the vertical to come in with the, the perspective, the point of view that's going to shift the game, sure. but you have to have the ability to connect the dots in a lot of different ways. And so that idea of education being the horizontal top of the T and then secondary, post-secondary schooling is carving out that vertical education in the broadest sense is really the development of the whole person. Mm -hmm. And when you start to talk about education in that sense, it gets really exciting because you, mm -hmm. you see how we can start to shape even the smallest or almost in the nearest seeming of environments to really be educational in the sense that it's working to elevate and work for the good of the whole person. Mm -hmm. And that's where you develop that horizontal line is thinking about the communities, the institutions, the places that shape your understanding of the world right? and, and schooling is where I, I think as you age in schooling, early schooling, I say is very critical to that, that top of the T, but of course, as you move in your schooling, those things start to intersect mm -hmm. and it would be interesting to have 
as a someone going into college that that major is just a, a stake in the ground for that vertical, but it's not the horizontal line, the way that I'm going to be as a whole person in all the different environments all interact with over the course of my life or career. Yeah, that's right. Because if that vertical defines you, you end up being more of an I, right? Than a, than a T. Mm. It can dampen the effect of, of even a broad experiences. Um, I've seen people go through, you know, very expansive experiences, building houses in in third world countries and, you know, doing all these things and they come back and they're not necessarily that different in their day-to-day -day lives because you don't broaden out into that T just through experience or just from having, you know, seen or heard something, you have to allow yourself to be affected or changed or impacted by it. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the top of that T, that's a great analogy. I, I think for me, music for me is what has always kind of rounded me out. And, you know, I noticed that Grady, you're a runner and, and Haley, you, you know, are an outdoors woman. As you all were talking about the coming away from the screens and things like that, running and outdoor expeditions and things like that, by definition, take you away from those screens and sort of the limiting sort of aspects of things. I wonder if you could talk about the role of those types of experiences in how you view the world and maybe, maybe innovation a bit. I love that question. <laughs> I love that question too. <laughs> And I know I'm going to love Grady's answer. <laughs> Grady, you've been sharing how you've reconnected with running lately in a really powerful yeah, way. Yeah. It's been, it's been great. I remember a time in high school, Jared, uh, I grew up in rural Western Pennsylvania and mm. it was a cold snowy winter. Like they always are up there. Mm. And uh, we were out for a long run after school one day and we're on back roads. It's just snowpack everywhere. And snow as far as you can see right right and we're in the woods on these back roads and i remember we come around a corner and there's three deer in the road and they see us and kind of freeze and then bound up off this hill into the woods right unbelievable and we just kind of look at each other like wow and we run up to where they ran off the road and you know what's there in the track in the snow are their tracks right we're like let's go right off the trail we climbed a fence and we followed those deer through we probably ran two or three miles through the middle of the woods. We ran down by a river and we saw their path along the river. We found a way across it. Our goal was just to see the deer again. Right. Yeah. And we didn't know if we would. Um, they're way out in front of us, but we could follow their tracks. And so right. I just then remember cresting this hill one time quietly <laughs> on this run and just looking down into the field and we saw them again. Wow. And I, just the exhilaration of that, right? Like yeah. that for me was one example of running that just... It was pure curiosity. It was just joy. We're following the tracks. Let's see where they go. Let's see where this adventure takes us, right? And so that's, a lot of running is like that for me. I don't wear headphones when I run. I don't want to hear music. I want to hear what's in the world, you know? Hmm. I love, I think learning is a physical activity that when my body is active and my blood is pumping and my muscles are flexing, like it gets me thinking and feeling in different ways and it opens my spirit and my mind up. And um, long distance running allows you to get into a rhythm and to a pace and you can lose yourself in that process. Right. And I think that's where some of my deepest sense of peace comes from. And a lot of where creative thinking comes from. I let go of all the expectations and all of a sudden things that interest me or the things that are important to me can kind of rise to the surface. Mm -hmm. And as they do, they mix and mingle in new ways. And I end my runs feeling great and feeling at peace and having seen the world in a new way. And it's often the source of just a lot of joy and curiosity in my life. Oh, thank you for that. I have the deepest admiration for runners, particularly long distance runners, being a non-runner myself, but an admirer of those, of those things. And that element of curiosity and exploration and connection to yourself physically, but also connection to the outside world. It, Grady, you almost made me think about taking up running. So that is the deepest compliment I can pay you, my friend. <laughs> uh, so likewise, I was thinking of moments running, moments that I've been running when I've spent time in the wilderness. The story you told just brought me back to a lot of beautiful moments. Two things and one, Grady, from your comment of the running it allows certain things to rise up in you and the power in that made me think of connecting to my wilderness experiences and how they've shaped and informed my being in the world 
my husband and I had this realization because he loves to go to the wilderness alone. Mm. And I have often pursued my time outdoors with others. And one of the things we are just exploring that contrast and that difference, but in my experience and guiding and being part of groups that have done extended time in the wilderness. So my, my leadership training was 90 days in the Wyoming wilderness from February to May of 2011, which involved a lot of snowpack initially and a lot of cold nights for a girl from Texas. 90 straight days? 90 straight days. I think there was a three-year period where I'd spent almost one year of, of nights camping outside. Wow. So I did 90 days. I'll come back to that in a second, but fast forward a couple of years, I was leading high school girls on 20 day expedition in the Wyoming wilderness. And these girls were 13 to 16, maybe a little older than that. It was the most humbling leadership experience <laughs> I've ever had, but they showed up that first day and they were in their teenage years from just such different backgrounds and sets of circumstances. And even in their development, you know, from being fully adorned in makeup to braces and mm. the full gamut. And after 21 days, we were hiking out to where we were going to get picked up by the bus. It was the very end of the trail. And we were all singing Lord of the Rings covered in, <laughs> you know, the stink of 20 days outdoors <laughs> And there had been such a unifying element of this time together where so many of the perceived and in some ways real barriers and differences between these women at this young age uh -huh. had been slowly broken down, but also just even eliminated by our environment and walking into an environment where we shared on a day-to-day -day basis, the very same basic needs mm -hmm. in a very visceral way in our, in our face, like we needed shelter. We needed to eat. <laughs> we needed to take care of our bodies so that we could move together. Yeah. And there was just the, the core of our humanity became front and center, like the really basic things that we needed to care for ourselves and each other. And every person sort of emerged at a very kind of soul level in this way where they just came out to play, to show up, to be fully themselves, not having to worry about things back home that mm. were affecting them or ways that they needed to perform in front of their friends or their peer group. And it was a very freeing way of getting to taste what's possible for how we might live together and how we might experience one another. And that's always what's drawn me into the wilderness is eliminating a lot of the barriers in a way that unifies us so we can experience each other where those things ri are <laughs> rising to the surface, as sure. Brady put it. Sure. And then the second thing that I've loved about the wilderness, maybe more as when I come from it, is that creating that point of contrast has helped me to see myself and the world more clearly. Oz Guinness is a theologian, author, friend of, of Grady and I's, and he said one time, and I'll never forget, he has a very thick British accent, which I won't try to impersonate here, but <laughs> He said, contrast is the mother of clarity. Mm. And so many times when I've been in the back country for two to three weeks and I come home, I see things about the place I'm going to that I would have never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that has given me a lot of perspective, which I have benefited from. And how do you take those perspectives and those aha moments and translate them into new environments? Mm. So a very concrete example is I spent 24 days in the desert of Utah, could not wait to take a hot bath, got home, filled up my bathtub, and all of a sudden felt this sinking feeling that that was weeks worth of drinking water, <laughs> <laughs> that I had had to seek out water holes uh, in the desert uh, and purify. And, yeah. and I had a new perspective on water mm -hmm. that I didn't have before. And that contrast helped me see that more clearly. Mm. That's a great example. Contrast being the mother of clarity is a, is a great way of thinking about things. And I, I think, that, you know, I'm taking away a lot from what you said, but one of the biggest things is just the duration, the time you're talking about. You're talking about weeks, you know, these increments that you're talking about. And I think people, and, and Grady, you're talking about running miles and miles and miles. And I think in, the, in our current environment, there's a lot of quick fix, a lot of how can I do this most efficiently, there's an EMBA, get your MBA in 15 months, get it in 12 months, get it in nine months, you know, 
all these other, you know, start a business in three easy steps. And I think what you two are both highlighting for me and hopefully for others is just there's value in one disconnecting, but spending time in things and, you know, immersing yourself in, in experiences um, so that you can create that contrast. You can't create that kind of contrast in 30 minutes or an hour or a morning. You're not going to look at a bathtub differently after, a, a, you know, a, a quick walk around the block. So that to me, I think is, is very powerful in, in both your stories. I wonder if there's any advice either of you might have for future innovators out there. Yeah, Jared, you can just get me warmed up. I'm like, man, now that, now that we've talked for a few minutes, like, I've got so much stuff I want to talk about. I'm like, can we start over? Just let's start the whole thing over. Can we ask about innovation again? <laughs> let me try to answer yeah. your question that way. And then Jared, if it fits, great. If not, I can answer it again. But it's just a few things I think are really important. And I think this is important for innovators. Sure. For people, and when I say innovators, I mean, I think people who want to make a difference, who mm. want to have an impact, who want to be challenged and want to have to grow to the occasion. So I think it's both about the kind of person an innovator wants to become and the kind of impact they want to have. Mm -hmm. I said it earlier, um, and when you're younger, I think you think having good ideas is the trick, right? But we all know that's not actually the trick. Um, right. Because often our ideas come out of the system that we're in, and we just don't realize that. Mm -hmm. I think what's really important, and you were describing this, is how do we become the kind of people that can, what we like to say, is sort of work from the margins, right? How can you sustain the creative tension at the edge of the system and actually see what it is? And if you can sustain that position long enough and hold the creative tension where you are sort of one step in the system and one step out, mm -hmm. where you have a distance personally and professionally and relationally, um, that you have the ability to challenge the system and its assumptions, right? Right. I, I think that's one of the most valuable things anybody who wants to be creative and have an impact and live a whole full life and create that kind of community uh, that really matters. Mm -hmm. Quote I wanted to share is from Martin Luther King Jr., who talks about um, the people who are going to save the world are the transformed, disciplined nonconformists. Mm. That's the language he uses to talk about the kinds of people that the system can't co-opt, the kinds of people that have a voice and a vision that are able to work upstream. Mm -hmm. When the whole culture is going one way, and it may be against something you believe or something you value or something you want to change, who are the leaders that are going to be able to take a stand against that current, right? Uh, right, right. We already talked about today being in a community, but also I think it takes being willing to be different, being willing to be disagreed with being willing to really say what you think. It's that creative tension. It's a little bit of that contrast. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm sort of in it, but I'm not of it. Right. It's that contrast where I think the really meaningful ideas for how our society, who needs them so badly right now, mm -hmm. ideas for how are we going to operate after a pandemic? How is work going to change in ways that are going to be more human? Sure. How do we bridge so many political and racial divides in our community. It just seems so overwhelming. We need leaders who, I think like King said, are willing to be nonconformist and have the discipline, have the perspective uh -huh. um, to do that. And I think a lot of that will happen in the private sector in more traditional settings of innovation. I think a lot of that's going to happen in our civic spaces, in our social spaces, in our community spaces. Uh -huh. So that would be my encouragement for an innovator would be get to the margin, get to the edge Find the artists that are speaking into your world. Find the musicians. Uh, Jared, it sounds like that's a space for you. Mm -hmm. Find the people that disagree. Find the people you disagree with, because it's going to be on that edge where um, those contrasts become clearer and your role becomes clearer. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Thank you. A visual of this that Grady told me once that has stuck with me is that if you're within the system, it's you're in the river, you're just being swept along. But if you can find a way to sit by the edge of the river, then you can feel the current under your feet. You can see it and you can have that mm. perspective. My advice for innovators, maybe saying <laughs> what Grady said really simply, is just cultivating opportunities for contrast. And trying to step almost kind of have a different vantage point on your life. If you were to step outside of it and see the ways that you're being formed so often we're formed by things we can't even see. I mean, the ways that our use of technology is forming us without us even being conscious of it. It's so important that we then create opportunities to be intentionally formed. What I, what we, called counter formation, but what are the mm. disciplines, the practices that I'm going to bring into my life intentionally to operate in contrast 
to the things I can see and can't even see because we can find a lot of inspiration and imagination at those intersections. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm spending my whole day talking on Zoom, that might look like once a month having a day of solitude or silence where I don't speak and I go on a walk or I read and that is in contrast to the norm in my life. But that's where we get refueled, where we can find rest and where our imaginations can gain new capacities for the type of innovative work that's going to be required to make the changes we need to see in this world. Wow. Thank you. That's great advice for innovators and great advice for me personally. So thank you both for that. I appreciate your time and so exciting to reconnect with you, Haley, and, and to meet you, Grady, um, I sense, you know, we're kindred spirits. I, I really want to thank you both for being on today and look forward to staying connected. And hopefully maybe we can have you guys back to cover all those things that went off in Grady's head that, uh, <laughs> that we didn't get to today. But uh, thank you both for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Jared. This was a blast. Likewise. Yeah, thanks, Jared. This has been a really good time. We really appreciate it. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T-L-L-C, or follow us on LinkedIn where we're Outlast Consulting. Until next time, keep innovating whatever that means.